Welcome and good afternoon. Thanks for joining us today for the K-State Garden Hour. This series is hosted by Kansas State Research and Extension. My name is Tom Buller. I'm the Horticulture Extension Agent in Douglas County. One quick housekeeping note, uh, this is a webinar format, so all the audience is muted and without video. Um, if you do have a question, um, there's a question and answer feature, so you can use that to type in your questions. Our moderator today is Ariel whiteley Knoll, and she's the horticulture agent over in Shawnee County. Ariel will be keeping track of the questions that come in, and she, we will do our best to get all through all the questions at the end of the talk. In the event we don't get to answer them all, we'll be uploading additional resources for you on our Horticulture Natural Resources website. This is a great reference for you after the presentation. You'll also be able to access today's presentation on this website. Um, today's webinar will be recorded and we'll post it uh, along with the previous uh, webinars. You can find our other topics and upcoming topics on that same website. Uh, Ariel's just posted the link over in the chat, so you can click on that over there. Uh, the events in this series have been posted onto that K-State Research and K-State Horticulture Natural Resources Facebook page. Um, so you can stay tu in tune with what's going in, in our, on in the department, as well as stay up to date on upcoming topics within the series. Be sure to like, share, and use the hashtag K-State Garden Hour to help us promote this program. The web webinar has allowed us to continue to provide extension-related education uh, on horticulture and gardening, given the circumstances we're in today. Everyone involved in the development of this series is an extension professional for K-State. Most of us have a background in horticulture, education, or related discipline. Most of all, we have a love for gardening and the natural environment. Oh, uh, sorry, yeah, the website isn't posted in chat. I don't know if you can post that in there, Ariel. We've got our Facebook link in there right now. Um, we have recently added several events to this series and we'll be uh, talking about some exciting things in the future. Uh, we have a week to week schedule through the end of September, then we'll have one topic per month until the end of the calendar year. Uh, today's topic is hummingbirds in Kansas, and I'm pleased to introduce our speaker today, Chuck Audi, who's the agriculture extension agent in Geary County. Please give us a few minutes while we transition to his slideshow. All right, Tom, thank you very much for that. Better make sure I'm unmuted here. Um, yeah, it's, it's hummingbirds. I mean, I've been a bird watcher since I was four years old, so I have been doing this for a long time. The um, past 20 years, we've seen an, an incredible explosion of interest in hummingbirds, which really makes it a, a lot of fun. So what I'd like to do is if we can, there we go. Um, this is not a Kansas hummingbird, by the way, but we're gonna put up a hummingbird poll right now. And if you'll just take a couple of seconds and, and feel free to fill it out. You don't have to fill it out if you don't want to. Um, my wife is a bird watcher also. And about 10 years ago, we took a two week trip to Panama where we saw over 30 species of hummingbirds in the two weeks that we were down there. This was one of them, and it's just absolutely a stunning bird. It's about twice the size in length as our ruby-throated hummingbird and about four times as heavy. Um, and it was just absolutely amazing to see those close by there. So see how many more pulls. We got quite a few people pulling in, so that's good. Um, but what we want to do today is just sort of share about some of the fascinating things about hummingbirds, why it, it's so much fun to, to feed them and just ways that you can bring more hummingbirds into your yard and to uh, enjoy them. Uh, I've got to be careful. I don't want too far off in the weeds or we'll be here for an hour and a half and we can't do that. So um, looks like the, do we want to, well, there's still a few more polls coming in. So we'll go until about a minute 30 and then close the, the poll is closed. Okay. Do you feed hummingbirds? 91% say yes. Um, how many feeders do you have up? 42% say they have one, 7%, 13 people said they have four or more. Right now I've got three hummingbird feeders up, so I'm in that 11% of three. And how often do you change the nectar in your feeders? Daily, every other day, every two to four days, when it looks bad? Yeah, I've, I've been in all of those categories, so um, that's, that's good to see. I mean, it's, this is the first chance I've had to pull this large of an audience 
on these kind of questions. So I appreciate you sharing that information. And if we can get that off of there, I don't know if I do that or, oh, I can do that. Okay, very good. So let's move on to something about Kansas. There we go. Hummingbirds are incredibly fascinating. They're only found in the Western Hemisphere, North and South America. Uh, Africa, Asia, Australia has something sort of similar called sunbir sunbirds. They don't seem to have the same flight capabilities, but they are nectar feeders. Hummingbirds are found at sea level in the tropics or clear up 12, 14,000 feet in the Andes of South America. Um, there's a lot of, uh, of hummingbird species that are found on two or three mountains and only there. They may rely on one or two species of plants for all their food and those plants may only be pollinated by that hummingbird. At the latest count, it's felt that there's approximately 360 species of hummingbirds between North and South America. So that's pretty amazing. I've got philosophies about a lot of things and, and even on hummingbirds and, and good selection and placement of plant materials will certainly improve how the hummingbird views your yard and whether they come in there and, and spend some time. But in my experience, to really bring in the hummers, you need plants and feeders. And feeders, I say, often in the plural. Sometimes the more feeders we have, um, the more, more hummingbirds we'll attract, or at least the more fun we have watching them. So what do hummingbirds want? What do hummingbirds need? Hummingbirds need the same thing that all species need. They need water. In this case, that's often in the form of nectar. Now, here's where your little hummingbird trivia that you can amaze your friends with. Most bird species have very efficient waste systems. They combine liquid and solid feces into, into one form of excrement that we affectionately call whitewash. Any birders in the audience today will appreciate that. Because of the, the high intake of nectar that hummingbirds have, hummingbirds are one of the few species of birds that actually urinate. They have solid feces also, but they also urinate. So there's your trivia for the day. So they also need food. It's not just sugar water. I mean, we've all had kids, nieces, nephews, grandkids that we have said, you know, stop eating that candy. You can't live on candy alone. Just like all other mammalian species, we need protein. For the hummingbirds, that's small flying insects. A lot of times it's not just the flowers and the feeders in our yard, but it's trees that we can plant that attract a lot of those late season insects. If you've ever looked under the, under the backside of a sycamore leaf or a redbud leaf this time of year, a lot of times you'll find tiny little insects and hummingbirds will feed on those. They'll actually go out fly catching. You may see them flying around your yard and they're catching small flying insects. They also need cover. They need shelter from weather and predators. They need safe resting, net, resting and roosting locations, nesting and brood rearing. In Kansas, Basically, you draw that line down Highway 81, um, Salina to Wichita and east, and that's where most of the hummingbird nesting in Kansas is going to occur. And it's gonna be a strictly ruby-throated hummingbird. But we do get some of the other species that I'll talk about in a moment in western and southwestern Kansas. There have been no documented nesting of any other species in Kansas other than ruby-throated hummingbirds. And that's what I just always talked about. So, you know, from, from Wichita, Salina, east, clear to the east coast, 99.99999% of all the hummingbirds you see will be a ruby-throated hummingbird. It may be an adult male. It may be a juvenile male. It may be an adult female, it may be a juvenile female. And those last three are all gonna look very similar. But if you're patient and you keep putting out your feeder and paying attention, eventually you will probably get rewarded with one of the rarities. Now, in Kansas, We've had 11 species of hummingbirds uh, documented to have occurred. A few of those have only occurred once. We've had Mexican violet ear. We've had black chinned, annas, calliope, broad tailed, broad billed, rivolis, costas, rufus, and allens. And there's been hummingbird species found in states to the north and northeast of us that more than likely flew over Kansas. So at any time, and especially this time of year, we may get one of those rarities popping through. For 20, 25 years, my wife and I very religiously put out our feeders in our backyard and we got ruby-throated hummingbirds. And then one Sunday in late July, several years ago, I looked out of the feeder and here was this adult male rufous hummingbird. Very exciting, a good adult male, the full rufous. My wife was still in bed. It was about seven o'clock on a Sunday morning and I went screaming into the bedroom because when you're a bird watcher and your wife is a bird watcher, you don't want to wind up seeing a bird in your own backyard that she doesn't get to see. So she probably thought the house was on fire. 
but I drug her out of bed and she got to see this little guy also spend the whole Sunday with us was there Monday morning and then he was gone continued his way on south so and then just two nights ago Monday night we were outside and and this little immature female Rufus hummingbird showed up now a lot of times you will see hummingbirds and even the ruby throats it will get some of this buffiness right in here on the sides or, or especially some gray dinginess. That's common in a lot of species, including the ruby throated hummingbird. But what you want to look at is look at the tail and right here where you see this rufous reddish orange brick color, whatever that is. Um, that was the, the good clue that this was not a ruby throated hummingbird. Also, Rufus hummingbirds are very aggressive. Even this morning, she was still flying around trying to drive everybody else away from, from her hummingbird feeders and her trumpet vine, which you'll see a picture of lately. So if you're patient, you will eventually see something else. Now, some of the other ones that, that are here annually in Kansas, broad-tailed hummingbird. And let's talk a little bit about hummingbird taxonomy, if you will. There's this nice, bright, shiny area under the throat that is nice, bright colored, is called the gorget. For the most part, only the adult males have it. Um, and, and this is iridescence, and it only shows up when they're in the sun and in bright light fairly directly. Otherwise, and I'll show you one in a minute where part of the gorget is in the sun, part isn't, and you can see the difference. But this is called the gorget, and you really need the, the sun to flash that thing up there. Broad-tailed hummingbirds are sort of the Western United States version of the ruby throat. If you've been in the mountains of Colorado and seen hummingbirds coming and going to a feeder, and especially if you hear this loud trill that's coming off of their wings, that's, that's a broad-tailed hummingbird. But these will show up in southwest Kansas regularly. The calliope hummingbird, very streaked gorget, very distinctive male. Streaked gorget like that, um, really neat. It's a small hummingbird. In fact, it is the smallest nesting species of bird in the United States. Uh, there was one out in Dodge City just just right now. In fact, a friend has one that is coming to his feeder out there. So the adult males, like I said, are always easy to identify. The females can sometimes get a little bit tricky, but the Calliope hummingbird is, it looks small. It's all hunkered up there, but, um, but it's a cute little bird. I need to also say thank you to my good friend, Bob Grass, for letting me use some of his hummingbird pictures in this program today. The black chinned hummingbird, I affectionately call it the K-State chinned hummingbird because of the purple gorget there. But here you can see where part of the gorget has, is, is in the sun and catching that light and the rest of it is not. In fact, if it's not in the, in the sunlight, an adult male ruby throat and adult male black chin are going to look very, very similar. They're very closely related. The immatures and the females of ruby throats and black chins are almost impossible to tell apart, even by hummingbird banders that have them in hand. It can be very, very difficult. So, but you get an adult male in the sun, you have no doubt that it's a black chin hummingbird by that purple. I'll just leave that there for a second longer because it's K-State purple, of course. And of course, the ruby-throated hummingbird. This is our, our hummingbird du jour, especially in the west, eastern half of Kansas. Surprisingly, you get out towards the Colorado border and ruby-throated hummingbirds become fairly rare. So that's just something to keep in mind there. All right, the hummingbird season in Kansas. Get a brief, furious spring migration. It's, I tell people, get your hummingbird feeders out by April 15th. If you look at the long-term dates, they're gonna hit the southern part of the state frequently the 12th or the 13th of April. April 15th is a good day to shoot for. And, and they're gonna be coming through clear up into early May. You may have this per short periods of time when you have a cold front blow through with a north wind that'll kind of stop migration. You'll have a lot around. But by the, by the end of the May, the, the ones that are gonna nest in Kansas are here and staying here. They're getting busy with their, with their job. The rest of them have moved on. The thing to remember about hummingbirds in the spring is they have one purpose procreation. They want to get nesting. They want to have young. They want to have offspring. If you get into, oh, the second week of June and you don't have any hummingbirds coming to your feeder, you can probably just don't have any nesting in your neighborhood. Take them down and then wait until later in the summer. Midsummer, on through early fall. And by midsummer, I'm saying from about the 15th of July on, that's when we get the southbound migration. The nesting season is over. They're heading south. They have all the time in the world to chase each other, visit flowers, visit your feeders. So at this point in time, you want to really make sure that you've got plants in your garden, plants around your landscape that are going to provide roosting habitat, food, and also something to consider for nesting. We'll talk about that here in just a second as well. 
and I already talked about that. Um, this is also the time when they're heading south that species that breed in the Rocky Mountains, that the Calliope, Broadtail, Rufus, uh, clear up into Canada. They start moving south and they tend to wander east. They will wander clear to the east coast. So that's when we really want to be on full alert, get out more than one hummingbird feeder, get out two, get out three, whatever your budget can afford for, for buying sugar. Maximize the plants that are blooming now. We have a lot of plants that bloom early in the spring, in, in April and May, that hummingbirds will use, but they're not that effective because they're not blooming now. So we really want to look at stuff that's going to bloom mid to late summer. Just a little bit, and, and this is something I added to this program a couple of years ago because everyone was so fascinated about hummingbirds nesting in Kansas. And this is all from Birds of Kansas, Thompson and others from 2011. Nest building has been documented from June 4th to July 2nd. Eggs been found in nests June 14th to August 10th. Nestlings from June 26th clear up to August 27th. Important thing to remember about ruby-throated hummingbirds. The female is in charge of everything. The male's only job is to make sure that the female lays fertile eggs. She determines the nest site, she takes care of them, she does the whole kit and caboodle. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. A little bit about the ruby-throated hummingbird. Their average length is 3.4 inches long, wingspan of 4.5 inches. Their weight is 3.2 grams. A penny weighs two and a half grams, a nickel five grams, so they're just a little bit more than a penny, less than a nickel. That's not a very big bird. Lifespan, the record is 12 years. On average, they're gonna live three to five years. I will tell you they have excellent memories. And I know this because one spring I hadn't got my hummingbird feeders out yet. And I always hung them from the same perch on my fence. And I looked out one afternoon and here was a hummingbird just perfectly going around right where the hummingbird feeder should be looking for it. Now, the only way he, he would have known that a hummingbird feeder was there is if he had visited it the previous year or two. So I hurried up and got my hummingbird feeder out and he stuck around for it and came back. So now keep this size in mind, 3.2 grams, not very big. They often nest near the tip of a down sloping branch. They want open area below, cover above, cover obviously to keep the rain and the sun off of them. When you watch hummingbirds come into the feeder, a lot of times they come in low and fast and then pop up to the, to the nest. And that's kind of a, a predator you know, defense mechanism. They can, you know, as they go up, they're slowing down so they can land. They want to do the same thing coming into the nest. They've been documented nesting in oak and hornbeam, yellow birch, poplar species, hackberry, pine, generally prefer deciduous over coniferous plants. They've been documented nesting one and a half to 50 feet up. Generally, it's going to be 16 to 23 feet high. Main determining factor is the availability of nearby food, nectar and insects. And the, the female is gonna be figuring that out from the time she arrives until she starts building her nest. All this information is from birds of North America. Arthur Bent back in the mid part of the 20th century was doing a lot of studying of a lot of bird species. And he spent time watching how they built the nest and, and the female will start, she'll find the spot and then she'll get this thistle down and dandelion down and spider web and start making it what they call a saddle. And this part cracks me up. He says she stamps down the base with her feet. This bird weighs as much as a penny. The only time they use their, their feet and legs are for perching. They don't walk, they fly everywhere. But she stamps down the base with her feet. Um, so then she just goes using plant down, bud scales and spider webbing to build up the sides of the nest. She uses figure eight motion. When she gets to the top, she puts the edge of the nest under her chin and starts pressing down to compress it and firm it up. Diameter, outside diameter is 45 to 50 millimeters at base, about a height of 40 millimeters. Think of a quarter. The width of a quarter is, is almost 25 millimeters. So a quarter will just slip down inside of it. If you put it on edge, that's how deep it is. It's not a very big nest. The eggs, think of those jelly beans you get at Easter time, the really small ones, that's about the size of her eggs. So I've spent my entire life watching birds trying to find a hummingbird nest with no success. And a friend in Clay Center sent me this picture one day of a hummingbird on a nest, a fr fairly freshly built nest. This happens to be in an elm tree. Um, and the next day she sent me pictures of a hummingbird on the other side of her house nesting in a sycamore tree. And I still haven't found me a, a hummingbird nest yet, but you can see how you've got this, all the spider web and all these little pieces of lichens and, and, and scales and just very perfectly identified. 
people ask, do they use the same nest from one year to the next? And my answer is generally no, because the hummingbird that nested in her sycamore tree, about the time the birds fledged, the nest looked like this. Typical teenagers are pretty well trashed the house. So if it stayed in good shape, they could possibly use it, but not very common. Hummingbirds, ruby-throated hummingbirds in Kansas are generally single brooded. In the deep south, they will sometimes have two broods. So right now, for the most part, hummingbirds, if they haven't gotten the young out of the nest, they're about to do that. So it's getting towards the end of the season, but we got migration coming through. Okay, what are some plants that we can put in our yard that'll be attractive to hummingbirds, that'll entice them to come in and check things out? Well, hummingbirds will feed on more than just red flowers quality and quantity of nectar in that flower is important. Take something like daylilies. You know, modern daylilies don't have nectar. So they look pretty, but there aren't any use for the, for the hummingbird. The color red is a flashing neon side for hummingbirds. If you've got hummingbirds coming to your feeder, put on a red shirt, a red top, a red hat, and just go out and sit in a chair near the hummingbird, you know, five, 10 feet away from the hummingbird feeder quietly some afternoon and just see how long it is until one comes and checks you out. They will do it and it'll just be an amazing thing to have happen. Okay, good old traditional red salvia is, is a mainstay. This is the old fashioned red salvia. Now we've got lady and red salvia that I personally like a lot better. Last week, Tom Buller in this webinar series was talking about using floating row covers to protect plants from that early frost. You, know, you get that early frost and then it gets nice again for two or three weeks. I've got friends in Garden City that plant about 30 pots of salvia every year, have them scattered all over their front and backyard for the hummingbirds to make use of. When that first frost is coming in, that first couple, three cold days, they pick up all the pots, move them into the garage, and then when it warms up afterwards, they move them back out. So even if there has been a freeze, they've still got blooming plants for the hummingbirds because the hummingbirds are probably still going to stick around. So that's just a little trick that you can do if you want to. Um, Agosta, I always mess up the pronunciation of this one, Agastaki, there we go. Um, hummingbird mint is one that's called for 15, 20 years ago. This was hard to find. You had to mail order this in. Nowadays, it's showing up more and more at nurseries. It's a beautiful plant. I've been out in the Rocky Mountains around big beds of this, and it's just loaded with hummingbirds. So it's a plant to consider if you haven't used it before. This one I use, I, I put in there and, and cringe every time I, I put this slide up because trumpet vine is aggressive. If you've got a small urban, a small lot in town, don't plant this. I planted one in 1987, the spring of 88, I started trying to kill it. I'm still trying to kill it and I'm just gonna sell the house and be done with it. It will run all over the place. But the picture on the left here, that happens to be at, a, at my house on the farm. And there's a windmill tower underneath that, believe it or not, an old windmill tower. But that thing is now covered with trumpet vine that I moved out there for my mother-in-law previously. And the hummingbirds are all over it. And it's right within line of sight of two of my three hummingbird feeders. And there's just a constant stream of hummingbirds going back and forth between the feeders and the trumpet vine. They probably are nesting up in there someplace too. I just haven't found the nest yet. If you've got a lot of room, you live out in a large lot, three to five acres or live out in the country, go ahead. If you've got a small lot in town, I would strongly discourage planting this, this plant. Scarlet runner bean is an heirloom bean variety. It's a climbing bean, gives you a chance to, to garden vertically, garden up, but it's got these wonderful red flowers that, um, that hummingbirds really like. So you've got a dual purpose here. It's something that you can take the beans off of it and eat and taking the beans off will encourage it to keep blooming. So that's just a, a good plant to use. If you look at packages of hummingbird mix, um, they've got a lot of different seeds in there for you to plant. Quite often you'll find scarlet runner bean in those seed mixes. Cardinal climber is, um, it's another one that if you live in the eastern or southeastern part of the, of the state or eastern or southeastern US, it, it may volunteer readily and become troublesome. But here in Junction City, Geary County, I've never had a volunteer. I learned about this one from spending time down in Elkhart, Kansas, clear down in the very southwest corner. And people would stick these, these pipes five, six, eight feet tall in their backyard and then run twine and tie it tight down to stakes in the ground, kind of like you know, a teepee or a wigwam. And then they would plant this cardinal climber at the base of it. And by September, when the hummingbirds were coming through, you just have this tower of red blossoms and hummingbirds just loved it. 
This is a very frost tender plant. So wait until you're well past um, chance of frost before you plant it. First frost comes along, it's just gonna wither and die, but it's a good plant to attract hummingbirds. Cardinal flower is native. I often associate it with wetlands. There's a small creek just outside of Junction City here that has a nice little patch of it. And there's always hummingbirds around there. There's hummingbirds that nest there, have for 25, 30 years. So good plant, especially if you've got a wet area, if you've got a wetland area, put in some cardinal flower. Bee balm. A lot of my sources talk about bee balm being a good uh, nectar plant for hummingbirds. Um, I don't have any in my landscape. I can't attest to that, but it serves as a reminder for me to mention that any of these plants that will attract hummingbirds will also attract other pollinators, including bees. If you are allergic to bee stings, proceed with caution. I have a very dear friend that is deathly allergic to bee stings and she continues to garden, put out lots of flowers and I think she's just flirting with death. But bee balm is another good all around plant. Butterfly bush. Another one that a lot of the, the books about landscaping for hummingbirds talk about. This is my butterfly bush. It's blooming great. I have never seen my hummingbirds go to it, but boy, the butterflies love it. And that alone is good enough reason to, to put it out in your landscape. I, I want to get a red flowered variety and try that and see if that does make a difference. But butterfly bush. Hollyhock. Every old farmstead used to have hollyhocks. Um, then they kind of fell out of favor. They're coming back around now, but if, if you've got the space, put some hollyhocks in there and then ignore it. I think hollyhocks thrive when you ignore them. Put them up on the side of a, of a, of a garage or along the alley or someplace, but they'll keep going and, and they're a good nectar plant. Hummingbirds will love them. Rose of Sharon is what I call a multi-purpose plant. It, it's a shrub. It needs to be pruned regularly to keep it blooming because it blooms on the new growth from this year, kind of like roses do. It's a good screening plant. So if you've got that neighbor, you just assume not have to look at their house all that often. You know, Rosa Sharon is a good plant to put out there. It's also one, if you have that spouse that's prone to going out early in the season, the first nice day in March and wanting to do some pruning, and then they tear into the forsythia and the lilac and the spirea and cut off all the blossoms. You know, plant a bunch of this and send them out to take care of that because it needs to be pruned in the spring anyway. So that's just a great opportunity, but a good hummingbird plant. I'm gonna wind up with good old fashioned cannas. Um, I've got red cannas here, but they will feed on any color of cannas. Uh, a good hardy plant, a good foliage and flower plant. I was down at, at some garden in Georgia quite a few years ago in September, big beds of cannas, and they were just alive with hummingbirds. Um, so that's another one. If you, if you like that tropical foliage look, that's one to certainly consider. Just some basics. I always have to throw that in there. Masses look better and are more likely to attract hummingbirds. The more of something you've got, the just it, it's more better eye appeal to you and the hummingbirds. Right plant in the right place, sun, shade, the wind, the soil. Take all those things under consideration. If you aren't sure, you know, talk to a master gardener, talk to an extension agent, talk to a, a seasoned nurseryman. They will let you know to describe your area to them. They'll say, yeah, that's a good plant for this. Or they may say, nah, you don't wanna plant that one there. And then just my, always my, my general analysis is overcare the annuals, keep them fertilized, keep them watered, keep them deadheaded. You want to encourage them to keep blooming. Those annuals are going to want to make seed. So if you keep taking the seed producing pods off the, the flowers after they're spent, they'll just kind of do this little panic thing and go, Ooh, I got to bloom some more. So then they'll put up some more flowers. And then a lot of the perennials were basically weeds that nobody else wanted and they thrive on neglect. So just put them in, do the minimal amount of work, you overcare them, it doesn't seem to work nearly as well. Need to also just make a quick mention about Orioles. Orioles, we have Orchard Orioles and Baltimore Orioles. These are all Baltimore Orioles on these pictures. Are our breeding species in Kansas, they will come to your hummingbird feeders, especially in the spring. In the lower center picture, that's an Oriole feeder. There, there is no difference between the nectar we put out for Orioles and the nectar we put out for hummingbirds. They will go back and forth readily. They also like grape jelly. A lot of birds like grape jelly. Uh, some studies are going on now that, that are coming up with differing re results on whether they think we should or shouldn't feed grape jelly. Um, but if you don't want to do that, cut in or oranges and in half and put them out on a nail. Uh, this feeder has a place right where you can, can put them right there. 
Um, but I just have nails stuck on top of an arbor and just stick the half of an orange on there. In the spring, when the Orioles come back, they are hitting that hard. Um, they're going to arrive about 10 days later than hummingbirds and leave about 10 days earlier in the fall. Uh, my experience has been that when the hummingbirds first come in, they will be hitting the feeders hard. And I will put up an Oriole, Oriole feeder. I do not dye the water. And I'll talk about the dyes here in a minute. Um, but they hit it hard. The hummingbirds will be at the Oriole feeder. The Orioles will be at the hummingbird feeder. They, they get along very well together. Um, but once they really get active feeding the young, they're out collecting caterpillars and they really start that they see is coming to my feeders. I've still got a few coming into oranges. I hear them chattering in the yard. So I'm still putting some oranges out, but they're gonna be gone pretty good, pretty soon. Uh, mockingbirds, catbirds, thrashers, house finches, a lot of other birds will come into that grape jelly. Birds are like people. They can have a sweet tooth as well. Okay, so right now, here we are the 12th of August. What should you be doing? Well, make sure your feeders are up, cleaned and have nectar in them. Clean your windows, it just makes it easier to see them. If you're ever trying to take photos through the windows, try to take the screens off if you can. I've had a lot of people send me, send me pictures. They want me to identify the hummingbird and we've got the window screen in perfect focus and all I see is a blur beyond that. So if you take the screens off, you got a better chance of your autofocus phone or camera or whatever getting the picture. Change nectar and clean every two to three days. If it's really hot, really sunny, it may be every day or two. If you're throwing away a lot of nectar, don't fill them so full. There's no law out there that says you have to fill your hummingbird feeder completely full. You know, fill it a third of the way full. If they start drinking all that in one day, fill it fuller and go on up. You know, if, you, if you've lost track of the time, I actually write down on the calendar when I change which hummingbird feeders, and yes, I have them numbered so I can keep them straight. Um, if, if the hummingbird nectar starts to get a little bit cloudy, it's time to change it it's time to change it. I've seen some really dirty hummingbird feeders and hummingbirds are still coming to it. Um, they can get sick. So, you know, keep that in mind. You do not need red dye in water. In fact, there's growing amount of evidence dating back to 2010 from Birdwatcher's Digest that says the dyes may be detrimental. The red dye concentration exceeds the recommended daily limit that FDA has for humans of red dye number 40. A lot of that red dye when it's mixed up will be 12.12 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. Um, and the, the human threshold is 0 0.007. So you, you don't need the red dye in there. You just need a small amount of red on the feeder. How much red? I've seen hummingbird feeders with red no bigger than, than your little fingernail and the hummingbirds will find it. That's how sensitive they are to, on, are to the color red. Just, you, you can't have too many feeders unless you're going broke buying sugar. Um, don't fill them completely up. Four parts water, one part sugar. Don't turn that around, you'll be making candy. Four parts water, one part sugar. People say, well, I need to boil it. No, you don't need to boil it. Warm water will help the sugar go into solution quicker. I usually have warm tap water at about 110 degrees. When I mix it up, it goes into solution very quickly. Even if you were sterilizing your feeder and boiling the, the nectar and putting it in and hanging it up, the very moment that the first hummingbird puts its tongue down in that nectar, it is contaminated. You're gonna be cleaning it, you know, every time you fill it, and that's one of the things I say, clean the feeder at each filling. You don't have to, don't use soap and water. Um, a lot of times the soap will leave a residue. Just use warm water, hot water to clean it, get a good brush to, to mix it up. Um, and, and just uh, the, the big thing to look for is a little black mildewy type stuff that grows. If you need to get that cleaned off, it's not scrubbing off easily. Just use some, some chlorine bleach, about a 3% bleach solution. Let it soak for a little bit. It should come right off. Rinse it out, let it air dry. The chlorine will dissipate and you'll be fine. No honey, no artificial sweeteners. You don't feed honey for the same reason you don't feed honey to infants. You can get them sick with a bacterial infection. You can kill them. I had several years ago, had a dear sweet lady call me up wanting to know how much, I don't know if it was sweet and low or what, she needed to mix to make her hummingbird nectar. I don't know if she had no sugar in the house or if she was concerned that her hummingbird was getting a little bit chubby there. But I explained to her, you need the sugar. That is an important food source. It's the carbohydrates that they need to live. So please, no artificial sweeteners. How much, how many hummingbirds does it take to empty a feeder? Well, one eight ounce feeder will fulfill the daily energy needs of 40 to 60 hummingbirds. 
Somebody else once said, however many hummingbirds you can see at any one time, multiply it by five or six or seven, and that's probably how many there actually are. But I have been to locations in Southeast Arizona this time of year when the hummingbirds are busy. I was at a, a bed and breakfast where they had 20 hummingbird feeders and each feeder was a two liter bottle of soda with an adapter on the bottom and they would empty them every single day. So that's a lot of hummingbirds. Having more feeders will allow them to feed more easily with less stress. I mentioned my little female Rufus driving everybody else off. Well, I've got another feeder on the other side of the house. It's out of line of sight. I've never seen her go to it. And I've noticed that traffic at that feeder has picked up in the past couple of days as the ruby throats have figured out how to get away from her. So more feeders will tend to defeat territoriality. Getting them out of line of sight of each other can help too. You don't need the dyed commercial mixes. They, they do have commercial mixes now that are undyed, but honestly, just go buy a 10 pound bag of sugar, mix it up four to one, and you're good to go. Okay, my summary of feederscaping. Hummingbird appropriate plant material along with multiple feeders will greatly enhance your opportunity to attract hummingbirds. Get your feeders up by April 15th. No activity, the second week of June, take them down until mid-July. Here I say August 1st, but get them up. If you don't have them up now, get them up. If you've got one up, put another one up. Then the question comes in, when do I take it down? Hummingbirds desire to migrate has nothing to do with the presence or absence of food and everything to do with day length. So don't worry about, I've got to take it down so they know to migrate. They know to migrate. I say leave them up well into, the, into early winter and look for the hummingbird that arrives late in the fall. The ruby throats are gone by about the 15th of October. If it's the 15th of November and you've got a hummingbird come into your feeder, call me. It's probably not a ruby throat. Let's find out what it is. It could be very exciting. We've had ruby, we've had hummingbird records in Kansas every month of the year until March, and I believe we had a March record this year, so we've now had them every month of the year. They are tough. They're not like an insect. They are tough. When do you take it down? Well, here's my cue to take down your hummingbird feeder. If you've got icicles coming off of it, it's probably time to take it down. Uh, this was a friend down in Wichita. This was their neighbor's hummingbird feeder. They'd had a, a Thanksgiving snowfall come in. And this is what the feeder looked like the next morning. Um, and, and that happens to be a, a glass hummingbird feeder. So I would want to get it down before it breaks. But anyway, okay, issues at the hummingbird feeder. Got to keep an eye on time here. Ants. And over the years, I've seen all sorts of people say, oh, use this kind of string or this kind of fishing line or grease it or whatever. We got this great solution now called a moat. It's the, the red thing here that you just hang from whatever your support is, fill it with water, and then hang your feeder below that. The ants can't get across there. The original versions of these were really small. I had to fill them up two or three times a day. These will last a couple of days. They've got even deeper ones. You just want to make sure your feeder isn't touching any plant material or ants will figure out how to get to it. Question I often get, I'm seeing hummingbird feeders at in my yard, but I don't see them at the feeder. My nectar isn't going down. Move the feeder. My experience, they like feeders more in the open and my feeders in the sunshine get a lot more activity than my feeders in the shade. So just try different things like that. A big debate on do we use cane sugar or beet sugar. Research says it doesn't matter, but if you're using something that doesn't say cane sugar, they're not coming through, try making the switch. It, it's not a problem. Bees, I noticed a little honeybee coming around my feeders this morning. You didn't get anything from them, but um, if you got dripping feeders, get rid of them. Honeybees will come in and rob any sweet source they can find. Avoid feeders that have yellow on them. If you've ever thought about why, why um, hornet and, and, yellow, and wasp traps, yellow jacket traps are yellow, it's because yellow is to bees like red is to hummingbirds. And then there's also for those that have little, you know, fake flowers on the side, they've got taller ones you can snap in now that get the opening far enough away that the bees can't get their tongue down to it. You can just take little cocktail straws, cut them off so they sit about a quarter to three eighths of an inch above the top of the feeder. That'll work too. People report, I don't have very many hummingbirds this year while others are reporting normal numbers. A um, couple of different things can happen here. I think we've got a situation in some cases of what I call NFS, neighborhood feeder saturation. Number of feeders within a geographic area exceeds the needs of the hummingbirds that are there. So they're just spreading out. They can have their own hummingbird feeder and they don't have any competition, less stress, energy conservation, you might say. So I think some cases it's just everybody's getting on the bandwagon. Um, and populations of birds can be cyclical. 
you can have hummers for several summers and then those birds wind up going somewhere else. Or maybe something happened to that group of hummingbirds as they were migrating or in their wintering area down in Mexico and Northern Central America and they, they didn't survive. In a year or two, it normally cycles back around. I just say, just be patient, keep putting stuff back out and you should be good to go. Okay, a couple of myths real quick I wanna get rid of. Hummingbirds do not migrate on the backs of other birds. I've had people swear that they have migrate on the backs of Canada geese. Well, if you look at the timing of hummingbird migration and goose migration, it doesn't match up. No self-respecting hummingbird would be caught dead hitching a ride on the back of a, of a goose. Um, finch feeders should not be near hummingbird feeders. The finches will kill the hummingbirds. I don't think there's a finch out there that can catch a hummingbird. They can outfly them easily. So in fact, I've got a finch feeder right next to my hummingbird feeder. It's not a problem except the house finch every once in a while lands on my hummingbird feeder and tries to drink the nectar unsuccessfully. Hummer threats. From what we can tell, predation is not much of a threat. A, house, a lot of things have been documented. Cats certainly kill birds. That is a big problem that I could spend a whole nother hour talking about, but simply cats need to stay indoors. 2.6 billion birds a year they're killing in the US and Canada. But other, other things have been documented taking, um, taking hummingbirds, small raptors, small hawks, shrikes, Baltimore Orioles, Eastern Kingbird, praying mantises, we've all seen those pictures, our native mantis, the Carolina mantid, um, it's, it's only a couple inches long. It is not gonna be able to take a hummingbird. The large Chinese mantids, yeah, they can take a hummingbird and that's been very well documented. It doesn't happen often if you see a large Chinese mantid out around your feeders, go out and get them out of there. Uh, but dragonflies, frogs, even large spider webs will catch hummingbirds sometimes. They're subject to accidents, uh, spiny or hooked plants. Burdock is a, is a non-native plant that has this big showy reddish rose colored flower. It also has a seed pod, kind of like a giant cocklebur, and hummingbirds can get caught in that. Window collisions, cars, radio towers. One of the challenges is because of small size, it's hard to find mortalities. You're looking at something that's not very big. It, you know, it, it has a collision with something, it just disappears. So the breeding bird survey does show that ruby throat hummingbird numbers are, are stable to increasing. So they seem to be doing very well right now, probably because everybody's feeding them. If you want a reference, a good reference for hummingbirds, um, Peterson Field Guide has Hummingbirds of North America by Sherry Williamson. You can see from the scan of, of my book, it's a well-used copy. Um, there's a couple of other good books out there. If you're really getting into it, contact me. I'll be happy to, to give you some additional references. But I tell people it's all about having fun. Feeding birds of any kind, it's all about having fun. If you have additional interest, ksbirds.org is a website of the Kansas Ornithological Society. It just has a lot of information about birds in general. Hummingbirds.net and hummingbirdsociety.org are two awesome hummingbird-oriented websites. Just tons and tons of good information there. Um, at, and that long, awesome one at the bottom, garycountyextension.com. Yeah, I've got a series of eight backyard birding guides on a lot of different topics there. So it, it includes landscaping for hummingbirds and some of those others. So we started with some hummingbirds from Panama. We'll end with some hummingbirds from Panama. Um, this was at a nature center there, some white necked Jacobins. Um, and we just sat there and literally spent all morning watching hummingbirds come and go to the, to the uh, feeder. So uh, that pretty much wraps up my talk and I'm right on time it looks like. So we can head on into the Q and A and I'll turn it over to whoever's got it next. Yeah, thank you, Chuck. Um, thanks for sharing all that information on hummingbirds. It was really interesting and insightful uh, and in inspired me. I'll probably go buy another hummingbird feeder after the talk. Uh, I do know we have a lot of questions to cover. Um, we'll begin our Q&A session and see if we can get them all done uh, by one o'clock. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ariel. Thanks, Tom. Um, Chuck, you did a great job and the questions are pouring in. So luckily we have a few questions that kind of overlap. So I'm gonna to try to prioritize those since a few people had the same questions. The first was a really good question. What is your professional opinion about the potential downsides of feeding hummingbirds as opposed to creating a garden with hummingbird friendly plants? Specifically, she wanted to know if you think that the hummingbirds obsession with red is actually related to people feeding them. Okay. Um, 
there have been dozens of studies for the past 50 years about feeding birds in general and does it have a negative impact back and forth and and the studies have basically come out and said don't really see that it makes much difference um, humans do enough negative things to impact hummingbirds, including letting cats run wild, uh, impact birds. And I think that, you know, we're just trying to balance things out a little bit. It's a personal preference. If you don't want to feed, you don't have to feed. Um, the, the sugar water, the hummingbird nectar that we make up actually comes pretty close to mimicking what the average flower nectar is. So uh, it, it, it's up to you. Certainly making a good landscape that's going to attract hummingbirds is not a bad idea at all. So go ahead and, and just, it's going to come down to your personal choice. Awesome. And then we had a few questions specifically about trying to create hummingbird landscaping in the shade. Um, one question was about seeing hummingbirds on hostas. And of course, those aren't red flowers. So why was that happening? But then also, what are some good shade plants for hummingbirds? Oh, shade plants are always a challenge. But it, I think any of the flowering shade plants, including begonias, um, help me out here, Ariel, impatience, some of those um, are going to help. The red is really going to, and remind me to come back to the red part of that question. The red is really going to help um, help invite the hummingbirds in but once they get into an area they're going to check out all the flowers they're going to check out absolutely all the flowers and and they learn they, they know which flowers have given them good nectar before and they will go back to those flowers so uh, the color red the previous question had a question had asked about the color red um birds virtually all bird species with the exception of owls see well beyond into the ultraviolet and the, and the infrared from what humans can see they see things differently than than we do and time and time again, you know, I, I, the, the red with the hummingbirds, that's not because we put out red hummingbird feeders. It's because the red to them is just glowing, just amazing. Um, there, there's some studies that are being happening right now about how birds see that is just absolutely incredible and going to lead to all sorts of new discoveries. So next question. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's awesome. No, that's great. Um, there's a couple questions about feeder. One is about height and then the other one is about whether or not a hummingbird feeder needs to have a perch. Does a hummingbird feeder need to height? Um, put it where it's easy to see, easy to get to. I like to keep it up. You know, most of mine are about eye level. I'm about five foot 11. So they're going to be about five to six feet tall because it's easy to reach. Um, hummingbirds, I watch them chase each other. I see them feeding on the and the turbine vine flowers clear at the top of the windmill and that's a good 20 feet up so uh, you know it it's not going to phase them too much at all just put it where you're e where you can see it easily and where you can fill it easily uh, with or without a perch um that oh boy that gets a lot of people going because there's a uh, an occasionally noted that hummingbirds late in the season when it's cool drinking cool nectar they'll almost put them to turn them back into um into their stupor especially if they're on a perch because the cold water, the cold nectar cools them down so much. I've never noticed it. Um, some people are adamant that there should not be a perch. They should keep flying all the time. Um, Sherry Williamson, who wrote the hummingbird reference I used, says it's up to the personal reference. If you've got a perch, a lot of times it's easier to study them if you think you've got a rarity. But again, that's going to be a personal preference. Great. Um, so one question was about someone who had actually observed an adult female sort of baiting a territorial male away from a feeder so that a juvenile would have an opportunity. Have you had any experience with this behavior or other behaviors specifically relating to the juvenile hummingbird? I had three immature male ruby throats in my feeder one year. And they all had, as they, even as juveniles, they'll start to get the red in their gorget. And they all had three different color patterns or different spotting in their throat. So I could tell where, which one was which. I called them Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie. Alpha was the one that tried to be dominant. Beta and Charlie, or Bravo and Charlie, developed this game where one would come in and then lead the, the dominant uh, hummingbird away, and the other one would come in and feed for a while. Alpha would come back, chase Charlie away. Beta would come in and be able to feed for 20 or 30 seconds. And they would just keep doing this all afternoon long. So yeah, they, they, will, they will certainly do cooperative feeding if necessary. That's awesome. Um, so another question was somebody had a hummingbird feeder out, had lots of hummingbird feeders, and then they disappeared. She put the feeder out around April 20th, and then in the beginning of June, all the hummingbirds were gone. Yep, and that's a case of they're simply not nesting close to her house. So in, in that case, if they're all gone, the nectar consumption just goes to nil. 
bring it in, wait until the 20th of July, then put it back out. But that, that's a classic case of where big numbers coming through. And especially if you have a wave of, of migrants um, that hit a cold front here in Kansas, that north wind blows for four days. We have it about every year in the spring. Migration just stops. And once the wind switches around to the south, they head on out. And during that time, I mean, I had at one time, I had over 25 Baltimore Orioles in my trees this spring hitting the feeders because we had north wind. So once that happens, they're going to move on. That's great. And that kind of leads into the next question. What's the typical feeding range for a nesting hummingbird? They're going to go no further than they have to, but they will go up to a quarter of a mile. Um, ideally, they're probably not going to want to nest that, nest that far away from food sources. So they're going to prefer to have it within a couple hundred feet because you, you've got mom there and she's doing all the feeding. Hummingbird nests normally have two, rarely three, occasionally one. And as you can see, if you remember those two hummingbird, young hummingbirds about to destroy the nest, um, they're, they're hungry. They want a lot of food. So she doesn't, she doesn't want to spend a lot of time in transit. That's great. Um, so another question was from somebody who's been buying frozen blueberries um, and putting them into jelly feeders for the Orioles and noticed one day that there was a hummingbird on that feeder, but it was also raining. So she was wondering if the hummingbird was just seeking some shelter under the feeder or if it was actually the smell of the jelly and the blueberries that attracted the hummingbird. Yeah, if the, if the grape jelly and grape jelly seems to be the preference. I had a friend that tried all sorts of other ones and grape was the choice. Um, as it gets warm, it'll sometimes get some liquid coming up to it. And I have seen the hummingbirds actually sipping the liquid that gets in that jelly container. Um, I, uh, bird senses smell is something we're still figuring out. So I, I don't know that they're smelling it so much as they just see a sweet liquid or liquid and they say, let's see what this tastes like. And, and they do that. That's fantastic. So you talked a little bit about this already, um, but should you keep hummingbird feeders away from other bird feeders? And then there was another question about keeping them away from squirrels. <laughs> okay, two different questions. It, it doesn't matter. I've got like four, hum four feeders plus my hummingbird feeder um, off my front porch. Doesn't phase any of them, except that sometimes the, 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 the finches will land on the hummingbird feeder and then I got to clean their mess off the hummingbird feeder. Um, squirrels, yeah, squirrels can be an issue. I, I try to keep with any feeder. I try to just keep other foods around. Um, I've, I also have troubles with raccoons throwing my hummingbird feeders on the ground. So I just have to take in my hummingbird feeders every night. But squirrels can be a problem. You can just try the same squirrel avoidance techniques you use for seed feeders. Great. Uh, and then one person said that they felt like they had hummingbirds that were actually purposefully running into windows. And if you knew why that would be. Not so much hummingbirds. Um, window collisions are a big problem. Cardinals are notorious for beating their brains out because they're seeing their reflection in the window. And they're going to chase that interloper off their territory. They get very territorial. Hummingbirds could do that. Um, there's a, a pretty good technique out right now. You can find it, you know, on the internet where you put very fine white lines up and down on the windows about an inch apart. And the birds see that and they, they, they don't want to fly through that way. So, and that seems to have worked very well. Um, some people just put up screening, loose screen that hangs down. So if they fly towards it, you know, it'll break it up. But if they, it looks like they're purposely going up and tapping at the window, they're either trying to say, hey, my hummingbird feeder is empty, or they think it is another hummingbird and they're trying to drive it out of the, their area. Awesome. Um, and then somebody else wanted to make a bigger batch of the sugar water mixture and store it and was wondering if they should do that in the refrigerator, if it's okay to leave it on the countertop. If you want to make up a big batch, and I've got friends that make up a gallon at a time and put it in a, in a nice tea pitcher, um, you can, it'll store in the refrigerator for about 10 days. Um, I find it doesn't take me that long to mix it up so I don't mess around with it. Um, but yeah, if you mix it up ahead of time, put it in the refrigerator, it'll, keep for, it'll be good for about 10 days. Awesome. And then those moats that you mentioned to keep the ants out, has your experience been that that is a haven for mosquitoes at that point, having that stagnant water? You know, it could be anytime you have that. So every time you change the hummingbird feeder, change the water in the moat. Great. Let me just go through and make sure we got most of our questions answered. And, and I'll tell people that my, um, my email address is on, was there on that last slide. I'm easily findable on the internet. If you have questions that, that you've come up, I didn't get to, or you thought of after the fact, drop me an email. I'm more than happy to answer your questions. That's perfect. 
Uh, one more question that uh, came in was what kind of nest does a hummingbird create? I know you were talking about the spider webs and the lichens, uh, right. but then there was also a follow-up question about if a hummingbird would use a different nest that it didn't create. No, no, they, they, they won't use any kind of a, a, a birdhouse or anything like that. They will make their nest um, and they're going to be very specific about where they want it. So don't, yeah, I've had that question before. What kind of birdhouse will a hummingbird use? They won't, plain and simple. And if you think about it, most birdhouses, you've, they've got to come in, land. It, it just, it's not their nature. They'd have to be able to fly into it, but no, don't even try. Okay. Uh, one more question about how fast hummingbirds fly, which I know you've talked about a couple of times. Uh, hummingbirds will, can fly up to 20 to 25 miles per hour. When they're migrating, um, it's a very leisurely flight. Um, and, and it's, you know, they may only be averaging 10 or 15 miles an hour, but they're feeding along the way. And a lot of times they're, they're going with the, um, going with the, with the wind. So it, it's a lot easier to go that way. I just saw something come up on the, on the chat or Q&A about the, the book that I mentioned was Hummingbirds of North America by Sherry Williamson. So you know, Perfect. Hold it up there, you might be able to see that. But anyway, yeah, Hummingbirds of North America by Sherry Williamson. Excellent. Sherry's a wonderful person. I usually have to send her one or two pictures a year going, Sherry, what is this hummingbird? So she's a sweet lady down in Bisbee, Arizona. Fantastic. So we had a couple questions uh, specifically about the nectar. One is somebody's using a product called Feeder Fresh to keep the nectar fresh, but the label doesn't actually say how long it keeps it fresh. Do you have any experience using that product? You know, I, that and, and I, I think I saw a question pop up on the chat about um, hummingbird mixes that are, that are fortified with vitamins and all that. We, we really discourage any of that. Use sugar and water, change it regularly. Um, if you feel like you're throwing away a lot of sugar water, Every time you have to change it, don't fill it so full. But really, it's just we, we discourage any of the, I mean, I know people that have been sticking honey in it. Don't do that. I, they, their stuff being advertised with added nutrients, added, uh, it just don't. Don't. They, they make sure you have good landscape. Four parts water, one part sugar, and go with that. And then another question specifically about the nectar, you know, you talked about how the dyed nectar really isn't beneficial. Why do you think that they continue to market those items with the red dye if they're not helpful for hummingbirds? Because consumers continue to buy them. I had somebody say, I'm going to continue to use it because I just think it looks appropriate. Um, Matthew just pop, top, tossed up a question there. I, I caught um, stronger. Do you, do you mix it stronger than four to one? Um, some people will go to three and a half or three to one in early in the year and late in the year when it's colder. Um, a lot of the experts don't recommend that. They say the flowers don't change. Their, their sugars, um, their sugar, strings of sugar in it. So we shouldn't be changing the nectar. Um, and why only in the Western hemisphere? Why are hummingbirds only in the Western hemisphere? Adaptation, that's where they evolved. Um, we don't know why. Why are, why are sunbirds only in Africa and, and Asia and Australia? You know, there's 12,000 species of birds in the world. Why are they in a certain area? That's how it happened. We, we can't give you a better answer than that. And then a question again on the feeders about cleaning them. Is it safe to use vinegar to clean the feeders out? You know, I think it, I don't think it'd be necessary. The, what most experts recommend, including Sherry Williamson, is to use just a weak bleach solution to clean them. You don't need to do anything else. I'm afraid that the vinegar may leave a little bit of residue that they may taste and may kind of sour them on it. And then one person said that they've seen some greenish gray hummingbirds in Overland Park, if you knew what kind of hummingbirds. Those, those are going to be ruby-throated hummingbirds, um, especially older females are going to get a lot of grayish green. Ruby-throated hummingbirds, after their, their juvenile year, after their hatch year, uh, get a lot of gray in their, in their belly, on their flanks. So. Awesome. Um, and then there's, you've sort of addressed this a couple of times already, but is there concern about contaminants and preservations when we're using grape jelly, plastic feeders? Um, shouldn't glass be used instead of plastic? Uh, most of the plastics that are being used now in, in the birds are pretty stable and not too much of a problem. Um, one of the things that they're looking at, that, one of the reasons why the concern over grape jelly and Orioles has come up is because some of the preservatives that are in there um, there's, I think in the next several years, you're going to see a lot of people coming out saying, don't feed grape jelly. 
just for that very reason. We'll probably see some all natural grape jellies come out as a result of that. But um, put out oranges, that'll be just as attractive to them. Great. And then a little bit of a different question, sort of on the B track. So let me know if, if we need to divert this to after the talk. But if your feeder's attracting honeybees, is that necessarily bad because they also need our help? So sort of those, <laughs> you might be attracting something you didn't want to, but is that still okay? Being a former beekeeper, I can tell you that if honeybees find a source of sugar water, they will swarm it and they can be so many that they will prevent the hummingbirds from getting to it. That's, that's the big problem. Now, we feed sugar water to, to bees all the time, especially early in the season or when, they're, when a hive is struggling. Um, but it's just that they will, if you're there to watch hummingbirds, the bees can keep them away. Great, Chuck. Well, I know we didn't get to answer 100% of the questions, but you did a great job rapid fire there. Um, <laughs> so any questions that we didn't get answered, we will have those up on our website. All right. All right. Yeah. Once again, uh, thank you, Chuck, for that wonderful presentation. And thank you all for joining us here at the K-State Garden Hour series hosted by K-State Research and Extension. Uh, really glad you could join us to learn more about hummingbirds. Uh, we do have a lot of very interesting webinars coming up. So be sure to check out our website or our Facebook page to see all the upcoming topics. Uh, this session has been recorded and will be posted hopefully by tomorrow afternoon um, on the K-State Research and Extension Horticulture Natural Resources page page that we mentioned. Um, after the webinar ends today, you should also receive a prompt to take an evaluation survey. Please take a minute to fill this out. We really appreciate your feedback. It help us, helps us improve our programming. If you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at ksuemg at ksu.edu. So our website or our email again, ksuemg at ksu.edu. Thank you again. Hope you have a great rest of your week.